Good morning, everybody. I thought the I thought the song choices were great. Uh, <laughs> uh, I I like just that arrangement on the the one we just sang with the chorus after two verses. I, I didn't I never realized the split I guess between the two verses, but that was that was great uh, in <laughs> more than one sense. Um, this may not be great, but I'm going to do it anyway. Do you ever hear voices in your head? Now, if you didn't catch the sideways glance between a couple of the elders going, well, guys, we've had a good run, but <laughs> he has finally, finally cracked. Uh, <laughs> I cracked a long time ago. Uh, it's been a good secret till now. Seriously, though, you ever hear the voices in your head? I know people who have full conversations in their head with people who aren't even in the room. You know, complete with gestures, right? It's like they've built a construct of the person and then they're going to talk to that person in real time, but not out loud. And it's, it's very awkward to watch. But do you ever hear voices? I'm talking about one specific voice. One specific voice in your mind that always seems to lean in one certain direction. It's not as if we're possessed, but it's like having a spirit in that you're, you're communicating in some sense, or at least it's communicating with you. And in addition to that voice, of course, we have all of the voices around us in the world. All of the different influences, all the different sources of messaging, all the different various ways we learn of things, all of it kind of clamoring for our attention, all of it trying to get us to do a thing or think a thing or say a thing or vote a certain way or whatever it is. It's like there are voices and there are spirits everywhere. My question to you this morning, kind of what's going to center this lesson is, to whom are we listening? Who is it that we're listening to? Because John really focuses heavily in 1 John 4 on the idea of listening to God versus not listening to God. Which spirit are you going to pay attention to? The spirit that is divine, the spirit that is God, or the spirit of the world, or the spirit of those that are preaching and teaching and talking from worldly perspectives? And when he contrasts these two in 1 John chapter 4, he's then going to discuss, well, how do we know to whom we should listen? What, what tests do we apply to this? How do we know what's legitimate? How do we know what's garbage? And how do we separate the two? As we read through our text again, I hope you'll follow me through that. It's 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to begin again in verse 1. It was read uh, very well just, just a moment ago. I'm going to read it again. Um, it's one of those things, exposure helps, right? Hearing it again and again tends to help it uh, center in our minds. When we read through this, John is going to describe for us the need to discern the spirits to whom we listen, to be able to tell between the two which are valid and which are invalid, which need to be listened to and which need to be avoided. And then in this text, he's giving us a couple of tests we could administer to figure out, okay, is this a voice I need to be listening to or not? 1 John chapter 4, I want to begin in verse 1. The Bible says there, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Christ is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, whom you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of, el uh, the spirit of error. Verse 1 starts off with a phrase that's really just against everything we hear in our world at large. Not to say, you know, right, wrong, or otherwise. But just this idea that somebody should not be listened to. Somebody and some people and some spirits, some voices, some influences should not be given airtime. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. That's, that's counter to our culture. That's counter to the messaging we get from the world around us. 
I mean, this popped up one time in, in, in some of the research I was looking at. This is, in, this is on how to have a, a better workplace, an inclusive workplace, right? That word inclusive or inclusivity. The idea that we're to gather everybody in every whatever they're doing and just be okay with all of it. This phrase popped up. It said, to foster an inclusive workplace, creating an environment where all voices are heard and valued is critical. It means actively listening to perspectives and experiences from diverse backgrounds and acknowledging the unique contributions they bring to the table. 1 John 4 1 says, don't believe every spirit. I, I thought it was supposed to be like we're told, you know, speak your truth even if your voice shakes. Right? Speak your truth, not the truth, but yours, whatever you think. That's what the world around us is saying. To read 1 John 4 and verse 1 where he says, do not believe every spirit, the world around us is going, believe everybody. Because everybody has some truth or some thing to add. I spoke to someone recently at Seven Brew, and you know how they talk to you, right? You order your thing, and then they talk to you while it's on the way. It's, some days it's good, and you know, whatever. <laughs> but the, the, the guy was talking to me, and we got on the subject of, of, of preaching in church, and he, he talked about all of the, the different approaches to Christianity out there. Right? Everybody kind of has their own different flavor, you might say. I'm like, well, I don't really agree with that. Telling everyone in our culture, don't believe everything you hear, don't believe every spirit, is weird. Proverbs 14 and verse 15 says, The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. I love this proverb because it's not just the simple believes everything and the, prov and the prudent, well, they don't believe everything, but it also gives you what happens to what you believe. The simple believe everything and then begin walking in according to whatever has been said most recently. But the prudent person doesn't believe everything. And they give thought to where their feet are going, where they are directed, what they're listening to, what comes through their mind. John's warning his beloved Christian brethren that they shouldn't believe everyone who comes along in this context with a religious teaching. Instead, telling them that they needed to test the spirits. I came from an environment where tests was part of the job. Right? Testing in school. We are testing to find out whether or not Johnny or you know, whoever it is has learned the material you give to them. But a test implies that there is a rubric. There is a standard of judgment. There's something you can take what you've been told and compare it to to find out is it good or is it trash. Elsewhere in 1 John, he's talked about other kinds of tests. Test of, you might say, are they doing the right thing? Or tests of whether or not a person loves their neighbor. But in this context, the test has to do with something that's being believed. It's a theological test. It's a test of what you think about God, or specifically what you think about Christ. This isn't the first time such a test has been given to God's people to determine whether or not a prophet is true or false. I won't read all of it with you this morning, but Deuteronomy 13, in the first five verses, speaks of whether or not a, a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises and then they give you a message. You're not to listen to that person. They're trying to lead you away from God. Even in the context of corporate worship. We talked about that a little bit this morning with our sense of community in, 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 in taking of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 29, when it's speaking about how worship is to be conducted properly, the Bible says there, let two or three prophets speak... And let the others weigh what is said. That idea of weighing what's said, considering what's being said. Is it heavy or is it light? Is it substantive or is it fluffy? I heard it said recently and I thought this was really good. It was in reference to some, some quote-unquote preaching that's going on. They said the message has too much icing and not enough cake. Right? It's this idea that it's all fluffy stuff. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 20, we're told to do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. In 1 John chapter 4, those spirits are to be tested to find out whether they're of God or not. The uncomfortable truth of verse 1 is that some people, many people, are just wrong. 
not misguided, not well-meaning. Those may well be true, but that doesn't change the fact of the truth or error of their word. Many people are just plain wrong. When they talk about Jesus, when they talk about worship, when they talk about this various sorts of our things in regarding our Christianity, they're just flat wrong. And it's not a problem in the great wide world somewhere, right? We tend to do that sometimes. Well, yeah, we know they're false teachers, but they're, so, they're off in these Buddhist countries. They're, they're in the Muslim countries. They're, they're way away from us. It's not even a far-off problem like, well, you know, out in the denominational world. Well, yeah, they got some, they got some wackadoodles out there, okay? You got some people doing some strange stuff out in the... Even with buildings with Church of Christ above the door, there are people that are preaching pleasant falsehoods or refusing to preach on unpleasant truths. And we have to learn to be able to say they are wrong. It's not a new problem, by the way. Jeremiah in verse 20, Jeremiah 29 and verse 8, God writing to his people in Judah, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. In Jeremiah 29, there are people running around saying, Thus says the Lord, and then whatever came next was wrong. It's happening then. It's happening now. Second Peter, hundreds of years past that, Peter wrote, says there are but false prophets also arose among the people kind of talking about what happened in Israel's history just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them bringing on themselves swift destruction the reason why John's so adamant about this is the first word of verse 1 he loves them they are precious to him elsewhere he would call them his beloved children and he wants his children not to be taken away and, and led astray by these falsehoods. So then how do we go about figuring out who's who? How do we figure out which voices are good and which voices are bad? Which spirits are good, which spirits are bad? Who's truth and who's error? Test number one, and it might seem a little bit redundant, but test number one is listen to it. Examine precisely what's being said. Now, to help us understand sort of, I think, where John's coming from, I want to back up just a shade to what is probably the error John is addressing. Because it seems like John, in this case, is really fixated on this who Jesus is question. Right? He's really concerned that people confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, you may not have had an argument with anybody recently on this subject. Right? Did Jesus Christ, was Jesus in the flesh as God? Maybe you have, but most people probably haven't. In John's time, the debate was raging in the religious world as to the nature of Jesus. Who exactly was he? Was he, was he Jesus? Was he Christ? Was he both? Was he separate? What's going on with Christ? It seems that John is answering specifically the beliefs of a guy named Corinthus. That's not Corinthus, like the city of Corinth. It's like Corinthus, like if you're from the south, okay? Corinthus was a first century, we would call him an early Gnostic. Not fully fledged at this stage, but an early form of Gnosticism. According to Irenaeus, he was a man who claimed in angelic inspiration. He, he opened a school in Asia Minor and then began teaching according to his belief system. One of the big things Corinthus taught was that Jesus was not born of a virgin. He denied the virgin birth, and he taught that the Christ was separate from Jesus, right? Like Jesus was the human person who came from Nazareth, who was born and all that stuff. But the Christ actually possessed him at his baptism, Right? Like, a, like a good version of demon possession, if you want to think about it like that. right? When Jesus was baptized, according to Corinthus, the Christ, the Spirit, came upon him, and that's why he was able to do the things that he did. And then at his crucifixion, the Christ unwent, right? He came and went back to heaven. I know it's weird, but that's what he believed. And he was going around teaching people this. In addition to that, he taught that 
there was, um, let's see, where's the note? Oh, he taught that Jesus was never raised from the dead. So not only was Jesus not born, or rather, not only was Jesus just a plain old human being, but he also never rose from the dead. Now that's obviously a problem, right? That, that's a serious, serious issue. And so now come back to 1 John 4 and note specifically what John said about Jesus. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Not that the Christ came to the flesh or, you know, joined with the flesh, but was in the flesh. It's a distinction that carries a lot of weight here. In John's gospel, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, John would say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. In the mind of John, there was no separating the two. Jesus and Christ were one, and they were the same person, the same entity. Even You might even look at 1 John 2 and verse 22. Uh, earlier in the book we're looking at right now, John said, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? In John's time, there were people running around like Corinthus with a lot of garbage, and he's calling it out saying, This isn't true. The one who's preaching this kind of stuff, they are anti or they are against Christ. They're not speaking the truth from God. John shows us here that what we believe about Jesus matters. What the truth is matters. And we have to be willing to hold true to that. In figuring out what a, what a person believes, I think there needs to be the principle of what I like to call asking the questions. How would John's listeners be expected to find out what a person believed? I mean, are, are they just supposed to, you know, let whoever they want come in and then just teach until they figure out whether they're speaking the truth or not? You know, just, we'll just wait and see if he slips up, right? We'll just, we'll just listen to him, and then, and then eventually he'll say something that'll, that'll cross the line, right? To find out what was believed by these teachers, questions would need to be asked. In addition to listening carefully to whatever is taught, specific direct questions have to be asked. What did this person believe in terms of Jesus? This isn't hunting for heretics, but once you figure out that there are wolves in sheep's clothing, you start checking for wolves before you start finding sheep carcasses. You don't wait around to find one and go, oh, I guess we got a wolf among us. Look at that. No. Proactivity is the key here. Asking the questions. Investigating what a person believes. Compare this even to how we begin our walk as Christians. What do we have to confess before we're baptized? We confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, right? Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Part of that obeying the gospel process involves confessing before other people that you believe Jesus to be the Christ, Plainly stated, preachers and teachers who are unwilling to state their belief or defend their statements from Scripture cannot be allowed to preach and teach, should not be allowed to preach and teach. And the reason why is because it's dangerous. John addresses this from the perspective that these people are a threat. If they were not a threat, why spend the ink to worry about this on paper to his listeners? Jesus said these type of people would turn up. Speaking of wolves in sheep's clothing, Jesus would say in Matthew 7 and verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Later on in that same gospel, in chapter 24 and verse 24 of Matthew, Jesus would say, False prophets, or rather, false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. They would lead all people, but they would be especially interested in leading away those who are faithful to Christ. Jesus said these people are going to turn up. John makes it plain to us here in our text. They're here. Notice the tense of how he puts it in verse 1. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Verse 4 of the same section. Of which you've heard it was coming and is now already in the world. 
When you look at 2 John in verse 7, he says this, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. In 2 John in verse 10, John also made it quite plain what should be done with these individuals. He writes in 2 John verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Maybe if we regarded false teachers as sheep murderers, we would treat them appropriately. Because that's exactly what's going on. They are leading away Christians to their deaths. Sadly, some brethren have lost their ability either to detect false teaching or their will to call it precisely whatever it is. And I wonder sometimes if some of our brethren have become, quote-unquote, so deep or so spiritual or so enlightened as to be above these low-level, divisive, you know, uncomfortable things. John doesn't seem to be so enlightened. Because John wrote, false prophets have gone into the world. And the spirit does not, that does not confess Christ is not from God. John recognized the threat of this. So how do we judge the words? I told you we need to judge the words. How do we do that? Number one, you've got to ask the questions. Believe it or not, some people won't tell you what they believe until you ask them. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm saying this like I've preached in a million places. I've only preached three places. This is the third. Everywhere I've preached, I've been asked questions. What do I believe on Jesus? What do I think the work of the church is? Where do I stand on the institutional question? What do I believe in terms of marriage, divorce, and remarriage? And many such questions as that. I've been asked directly by people, what do you believe? And I've had to give them answers from Scripture. Why? Because the threat of false teachers is in the world. It's present. It's here. It's dangerous. And people will be led further away from God if it's allowed to persist. And so if you want to find out what a person believes, you've got to ask the questions. And after doing that, you have to compare them to the Bible. Acts 17 and verse 11 is our favorite example of this, and it's a good example. Because when Paul was preaching to the Berean brethren, it describes them there in Acts 17 and verse 11, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They were listening to Paul. And you think, well, sh surely we can trust what Paul says. They took what Paul said and took it to the Old Testament and said, is this true? Is this real? Is, he, is, he, is, that, is that actually what's supposed to happen? We have to be willing to do that. I remember it said in sermons all throughout my childhood, a preacher would get up and he'd say, listen, if you find something that I have said that is contrary to the Bible, you would be my friend if you would bring it to me. And I want to echo that sentiment. If you hear me say something that's apart from Scripture, you come let me know because I need to know and so do the rest of you. We want to all make sure we're on the right track here. Thirdly, don't be afraid to defend the truth on any platform. I mean, debates, weren't built, or debates aren't specifically for pulpits, but can I suggest there's a better place to do a debate than a Facebook post? I mean, have you ever seen one of those go well? I got off of it a little while ago, so I can't tell you what's going on there now. But when I was there, I can tell you this. It didn't go well. I mean, imagine a debate in real life where people could, you know, run in the door, yell something, and then run away. That's what the debate on Facebook is like, right? It's like having an empty room, and then this door opens, and someone goes in and goes, Ha, you're wrong, and I know why, and they leave. Not the best way to have it. Have it in person. Long for the good old days where people had to be in the same room to be mad with each other. I love this quote. This is from a, a debate between Gus Nichols and C.J. Weaver. They, debate, they debated over the, the work of the church versus the, the holiness church, I believe it was. But Nichols said this in his opening remarks. He says, I'm happy to meet with my distinguished opponent and discuss these issues with him for the benefit of all who may be willing to learn. We have no unkind feeling toward one another, and I trust that the truth may shine brighter as it comes forth from the heat 
of controversy. I love that line. The truth's going to shine when you apply a little heat to it, right? And the rest of it will be burned up. If you're getting ready to defend the truth, let me tell you, not everyone is. And we've got to be prepared for objection. We were prepared for objection from a number of different avenues. There are some who object to debate simply because they just haven't the will to stand and be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within them. First Peter notwithstanding. Standing for the truth means tightening one's core belief and raising one's backbone upright, and some simply haven't the strength to do it anymore. Some will object to debate because their ignorance of the seriousness of the issue being debated is evident. You might not think John's raising a fit about Jesus having come from the flesh means a big deal, but it did. Sometimes we just say it's not a big deal because we don't have an idea about how big the deal is. And some people won't debate because the light of truth would shine just a little bit too brightly and it would expose corruption in what they've preached and what they've taught. They don't want to debate because they would know better. Test number two. Test number one in 1 John 4, look at what they've said. Break it apart. Break it down. Examine it. Compare it. Debate it. Talk about it. Number two is look at their lives. Not just what they've said, but look at who they are. Look at where they, where they associate with. Look at the lives of these people. In verse 5 of this section, notice what John says. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. All these things make it clear which side these folks are on. Now for John, and also for the rest of Scripture... There's no middle ground between truth and error or between a true teacher and a false teacher. There's no third party. John doesn't count these people as brethren or beloved or little children. It doesn't mean we can be unkind. But there's no third category for John where he says, yeah, they're wrong, but they'll be okay. I, I know we believe differently, but th they'll be fine in the end. They're not as bad as those other folks. But, but there's no middle ground for John. He simply says, they're from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. Did you notice that John didn't distinguish between, well, maybe they were brethren at one point, but they turned, and those that were never brethren in the first place? You know why? Because they're in the same boat. You're either with the truth or you're not. You're either from the world or you're from God, or with God might be better to be say. This doesn't prevent the possibility of repentance. But John spoke of those who were outside in Revelation 22 and verse 15 when he wrote, Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. It's like when I was a kid and I was told, look, you had to be inside or you had to be outside. There was no standing in the doorway because the AC is going to get out, right? You got to be in or out. There's only one. Same with John. You're either from the world or you're from God. And the reason why it's so serious is because faith and hearts are at stake. Paul would write in Romans 16 and verse 17, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. One valuable thing to do here in terms of looking at the lives of people, and in this case I'm thinking specifically of the books people have written. The good thing about Amazon is that normally when you look up someone's book, it'll also show you a list of endorsements underneath. Right? Like this person from this theological school, or this person from this church, or this person from this university. Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Read down through there. If the world thinks that a book's pretty good, that may be a problem, right? If you're reading a book and it's a religious book of some sort and everybody underneath it is nobody you would have speak in a pulpit, maybe avoid it. Because what did John say here? He says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. They're together in this. 
they align, and they align somewhere outside of Christ. If you back up to verse 4, note that John reminds his listeners that Christians are on the winning side of things. As Derek brought up in the songs that he picked, the greatness of God versus the ungreatness, if that's a word, of those who are in the world. It's easy to forget that we're on the winning side because of present circumstances. After all, Paul described Christians in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7 and following as afflicted and perplexed and persecuted and struck down and being given over to death at least until the resurrection. The pressure of persecution or even just the pressure of being in the minority causes us to grow wayward eyes and itching ears and a desire to do what the world does. We get tired of being opposed by the world. And we start looking for ways to alleviate the pressure. John reminds his brethren that listening to God is still the best way. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John's readers would forget that. And so do we. We forget sometimes that who is within us is greater than who is within the world. Believe it or not, we have more false teachers and worldly spirits now than they did then. We have to be reminded of that. Finally, John brings up this. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not of God does not listen to us. Again, John distinguishes there's world or there's God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. No third category. If you're listening to God, you're of God. If you're not listening to God, you're not of God. All of us are listening to someone, either to God or not to God. One of the two. You remember that listening is distinguished from hearing by the response. It's like when you tell your kids, you know, go, go clean your room. And my kids, yeah, and they scurry off, right? Did they hear it? Sure. Did they do it? Depends, <laughs> right, on the day. But what do we say when they don't do it? You didn't listen to me. Does it mean they didn't hear? No, it means they didn't respond appropriately to what they've been told. Come back to 1 John. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not of God does not listen to us. It begs a valuable question. Are you listening or are you not? At some point, we have to be willing to ask the question, to whom am I listening? Because John gives us two options. He describes those who hear the gospel of Christ as delivered by John and other people, and he describes those people as being from God, they know God, and they've overcome the world around them. John also describes those who do not listen as being from the world. They speak from the world, the world agrees with them, and they're going to find themselves not on the winning but on the losing side. There's no third message, there's no middle category with John's letter. If you've ever watched, I don't recommend it, but if you've ever watched a congressional hearing, you ever seen any of those? And you get your, your congressman or your whoever it is up on the stage, and they, they, they always tend to ask yes-no questions. And the people on the floor tend to never give yes-no answers. Because yes-no questions, there's no middle ground, right? Well, there is if you listen to the answers, but in reality, there's just yes or there's no, right? There's listening and not listening. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? If not, why not? Who are you listening to? Are you listening to God? Or are you listening to someone else? Are you living life in the light of Christ? Yes or no? Are you listening to God? Or are you not? If you're not, who is it that you're listening to? What spirit now fills your ears? Is it a teacher? Is it a best friend? Is it a social media outlet? Is it a worldly co-worker? Is it someone in your family? Who are you listening to? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. It's a proverb that was so important that it was repeated two chapters later in chapter 16 and verse 25, word for word. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way 
to death. I am increasingly convinced that the most dangerous false teacher of them all is not some overlearned theology professor in a faraway school. It's not a charismatic, gifted, quote unquote, pastor in some mega church somewhere. It's not even the most popular person on social media. Because there's one voice or there's one spirit that consistently convinces millions of people every day that they do not need to listen to the Spirit of God. And you might be thinking, I know this one. It's Satan. You know, I've never heard Satan speak. But the person I have heard is the voice in my head telling me that it'll be all right. I've heard my voice saying, eh, it's not such a big deal. I've heard my voice saying that I've got plenty of time. I've heard my voice say sometimes to myself, eh, it's just a lot of Sunday morning preacher talk. I've heard my own voice say, you've got some things to handle first. I've heard my own voice say things like, well, God will understand just this one time. Or God wants me to be happy. Or On and on the list goes. What I really come to realize is the most dangerous false teacher in my life is me. Because I'm the one convincing myself to not listen to God. Or at least trying to. I want you to leave here thinking about this idea. The most dangerous false teacher of all is the one sitting in your chair. Because it's that person that's trying to convince you not to listen to God. Every day, every choice you make. And the question I want to leave you with is, to whom will you listen? Will you listen to yourself or will you listen to God? If you're willing to listen to God's call to obey the gospel, then we are ready to help you with that. If you're ready to listen to God's call to faithfulness, then we're willing to help you with that. If you're willing to listen to God, I ask that you make that known to us, and I ask that you do it today. Not tomorrow. That voice in your head telling you to wait till tomorrow, that's not the voice you need to listen to. That voice telling you it'll be okay, that's not the voice you need to listen to. I beg you this morning to listen to God and tell that other guy to take a hike. If you're willing to come to Christ, I beg you to do so as we stand, as we sing. I invite you to come.